Good evening. Uh, it is with great pleasure that we are here all that night to interview Agnes Maria Kaiki. First of all, I would like to apologize on behalf of Tiso Chris because uh, due to technical difficulties and technical problems that were beyond our control, uh, the initial interview that you um, had the um, uh, kindness to give us during the convention unfortunately was erased. But um, um, because of that, we had the opportunity to see you again and we are delighted for that. And we want to thank you for your time thank you. and for meeting us again today. Thank you very much. I love second chances. <laughs> <laughs> yes, so do we. Um, and all those of us who were present during your very uh, uh, interesting uh, panel presentation heard with a great enthusiasm and a great uh, deal of interest uh, your comments about trauma and mm -hmm. the way that it affects uh, children's cognitive right. development. Right. Um, just to connect this with your presence at the Tissot Greece Convention, would you care just to give us a, the main idea, if you would like, about your main presentation? Sure, absolutely. Um, children are such joyful, natural learners. It's what they do best, and by the time they are three years old, they have been able to stand on their two feet, to speak a language, to make tumbles, and to run, and um, to construct uh, imaginary tales out of everyday things like spoons and glasses, and make boats out of wood. It's quite amazing what they can do with their imagination, and with their ability to really sponge in information. So there's a big question, what's happening? By the time they go to first grade, they're so excited. They are just deliriously happy to be going to the big school. And by the end of their first grade, they're very unhappy about this experience. For me, this is the onset of the educational trauma. That is, uh, how the experience of, of school estranges them sometimes and to some extent from their ability to learn naturally, joyfully, effortlessly and easily. So something is happening in, in, in there and this is especially true for our Greek culture where um, the goal of getting an education is very important for parents and they just are so eager to see their child performing well and doing well and this only complicates things. Um, how can teachers diagnose such traumas? Right. Um, I think as a good starting point is for teachers to realize that not all children learn the same way. So for some kids, you know, who go into class and, and just handle a book, look at the blackboard, it's so easy for them. So kids that love the visual modality, for example, um, school can be smooth. But there's those kids that learn by doing, that learn by jumping, by moving. You know, they're just machines that need to be on their own mode to, to be able to learn. And then the teacher says, sit still. But that kid is not learning by sitting still, or when they are sitting still. And so for me, this, the first step for a teacher is to first accept that every child learns differently. I know it's very tough for teachers because they still have to teach um, the whole class um, at the same pace and it's a big challenge. However, um, nobody said that the teacher's job is easy. <laughs> yeah. And do you believe that perhaps uh, some of the teacher's discipline methods could create such traumas? Right. That's a, such an excellent question, Olga. Um, for me, an element that is missing from school curriculum is, and is missing from both teachers' attitude as well as a spe specific lesson taught in, to be taught in class is our attitude to mistakes. What, what I like to repeat very often to myself, first of all, is that an organism that does not have an attitude mm -hmm. uh, towards failure, towards mistakes, um, towards um, not delivering up to standard, if we do not have an attitude towards that, a positive, an encouraging, 
and an attitude full of faith about what's possible nevertheless, despite the mistakes, then that organism is doomed to create um, people of obscurity, people of moderate standards, and people who are not really reaching into their potential. Because the only way to learn deeply and fully is to be fearless. Mm -hmm. And um, myself, um, the first thing that really helped me stand on my two feet was the time when I said, it's okay, this is not a very good grade. Mm -hmm. And it's okay, and it has nothing to do about who I am, if I'm good or bad, if I'm smart or not. And, um, and so I think that this is a very good place for, for teachers to start, to teach the kids to rebel in their failures. Mm -hmm. I remember my own dyslexic son who was coming home with a, um, with a, a grade book full of red, red markings from the teacher. Actually, they were blue. Uh, red was not supposed to be the, the pencil to mark a, a child's um, homework. And he was kind of disheartened. And I told you, I, I used to tell him that you're privileged because you're the one who's going to look at every single word over here on your homework for a second time. And this is precious. I did not, I don't think I did comfort him all that much. But it did make a difference and he learned to persist, mm -hmm. not to give up because of being hurt. I understand. Well, uh, thank you very much for your time, first of all. It was such a privilege to hear you speak during the Tissot Peace Annual Convention. I appreciate and it. And we welcome the opportunity to meet you again. So thank you very much. I appreciate much. it. I will look thank forward so to much. that. Thank you. Bravo.